So good evening, uh, good evening, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is Andriy Partnov. I'm teaching Ukrainian and East European studies at the European University of Viadrina, uh, Frankfurt Oda. And tonight we have a special event. Uh, on the one hand, it's uh, as usual, it's Monday evening, so we have our Ukrainian studies online colloquium. On the other hand, uh, it's the last session this semester. So we are a little bit, uh, yeah, how to put it, like sad about it. On the other hand, we are proud of what we've done before. So uh, today we have a special uh, guest, a special lecture, a guest lecture by our colleague, uh, Lena Panko. But before I give a floor to her, I'd like to share a couple of thoughts about our experience during this semester. Uh, because uh, let me be frank with you, it was an unusual experience. I would say an experiment to all of us um, and how it happened and why so. Uh, so I'd like to uh, stress it once again that this idea of uh, Ukrainian studies online colloquium came to me with or from Lukas Jura, one of my students, the student uh, at the Humboldt University. And it was actually Lukas who suggested to consider such a format. And afterwards uh, we've created, we've established a kind of a student committee. I've learned this word uh, earlier with our events at the Prisma Ukraina Research Network Eastern Europe. And of course, it's my big pleasure and my probably first task for tonight is to thank once again all the members of our student committee because I should tell you, dear colleagues, that the entire program, yeah, all the procedures, they were done actually by this group of people, not by me, you know, or someone else. So it was Lukas, as I've already mentioned. Uh, it was Bajana Kozakevich, whom you already know and whom I'll introduce a little bit later. Once again, it's Ellen Budinova, uh, also my former student from the Free University, Berlin. Uh, Ellen also worked as a coordinator for our Prisma Ukraina Research Network Eastern Europe project. And last but not least, it's Victoria Savchenko, who also works for our chair of Entangled History of Ukraine and who is now uh, finishing her master thesis at the Viadrina. So it was our decision, our common decision, dear colleagues, to give a strong preference to those of you who are, okay, how to call it, early career scores, uh, people who just uh, starts or kind of like doing their PhDs, okay? So not established scores, not professors, stuff like that. And we also decided, uh, you know, whom to select and whom to ask to be a commentator to our meetings. And then we also decided uh, to try to experiment with the YouTube translations of our colloquiums, yeah. And now we have all those sessions available online, so we could like rewatch them and rethink what was happening there. And uh, what I've tried uh, as much as I could, I've tried, to, of course, to create and to support uh, the a productive, creative atmosphere in our group. I should tell you, it was and still is, and I will hopefully it will be <laughs> for some time in the future, a true dream team. So I am proud and happy uh, to have such colleagues, and I want to thank them once more for this cooperation and for this, let's say, common, exciting experience with this colloquium. Uh, now, of course, it's about online format, yeah, kind of a new format to all of us. But I think we've tried our best to, uh, you know, like to, okay, let's put it this way, to exploit it as much as we can in order to invite people from all around the world to participate in our sessions. And I would say it was a kind of a success because you see one of our ideas was to show also to our sons the scope of Ukrainian studies nowadays, uh, both let's say disciplinary and geographically and I could tell you now that uh, during this last semester, we've had uh, presentations or talks uh, in such fields of research as history or different types of history to be more precise, political science, uh, theater, sociology, literary studies. And uh, in terms of geography, it, it was not just, you know, like Ukraine and Eastern European countries, but also such uh, countries as Switzerland, Germany, France, the United Kingdom, Austria, Canada, and the United States. Um, so I'd like to use this opportunity to thank once again to all the participants of our colloquium, to all the commentators, 
who found uh, some time to comment on the sessions. And of course, we are especially grateful. I'd like to stress it as much as I could. We're especially grateful to those of you, uh, dear participants, who showed up every Monday. And you know, I have a feeling now, I could tell it that, okay, it's kind of a responsibility feeling and a great pleasure feeling, because now I feel that uh, those of you who were kind enough to show every week, you really belong to our chair, to our university. And we are more than eager to, you know, proceed with all possible activities, ideas, whatever. And uh, you should always, of course, count on us, on our support, assistance, and whatever you need in your research activity. I would also like to thank all the Viadrina students who joined us. Um, it is always, of course, important to have uh, yeah, students involved. And I'm very, very grateful to our audience because uh, some people, like for instance, uh, my very good colleagues, uh, Katerina Biga, Rebecca Harms, they, they showed up many, many times and we are very grateful for that. Um, it's in, again, for me, it's again an argument for this online format, despite all the difficulties yeah, we are facing. Every time we have to use Zoom or some other platform instead of meeting, you know, all together in our nice Frankfurt order, <laughs> uh, border town. Um, now, making of some kind of very, very general observation or conclusion, I'd like to go back to what we've discussed in the very, very first meeting, yeah, uh, last year. I mean, the pretty obvious uh, prevalence of modern and contemporary topics if you're talking about Ukrainian studies nowadays. You know, dear colleagues, in the beginning of the 20th century, so like 100 years ago, the founder of modern Ukrainian historiography, Mikhail Groshevsky, he actually wrote many times in different texts that uh, Ukrainian history over then, so 100 years ago, it was mostly the history of old Rus or the Cossack times. And Groshevsky said, we need much more done about, you know, contemporary developments. 19th century, we have not enough scholarship. Nowadays, I'm afraid we have to say, maybe somebody will still do old Rus history or Cossack times, you know, or, or early modern times, because we have this like, you know, again, like over-representation of the uh, contemporary topics, which is absolutely okay. It's just the, you know, understanding of the logic and tendencies in the field. What, of course, we also notice, and that's nothing new again, it's not just Ukrainian studies issue, is a fragmentation of the field, yeah? So on the one hand, we are always talking about interdisciplinarity, and I'm a very big fan of it. On the other hand, we should probably talk about fragmentation. And you know, like one of my very general questions to all of us, we could even discuss it later on if you wish to, like something like that, is the common ground of knowledge, yeah, intellectual approach still possible? Or maybe even this way, do we still need it? Maybe we don't need it anymore. Maybe it's just the time for fragmented, uh, you know, like research of different uh, aspects whatsoever. And do we also still need some room for disagreement? Are discussions and critical remarks still relevant? I hope you've noticed, dear colleagues, that some commentators uh, during our sessions decided to be not just polite, but I would say too polite, yeah, or like to avoid any critical comments at all. Others decided to be maybe too critical. <laughs> Others, you know, tried to find some middle way, which is always <laughs> nice and difficult to do. But I think the question is serious. I mean, it's the question about the relevance and the importance of the culture of discussion and the culture of disagreement uh, nowadays. And then, of course, uh, the challenge of the format, yeah. I would say it is not, or it was not just the matter of what's better to read your paper, to tell the story, to combine it, <laughs> to do both. But it was also the question, let's put it this way, how to make our research topic understandable and interesting to a broader audience. Because if it's interesting for us, for me, it's not necessarily automatically interesting or understandable to even you know, other specialists in the field, but if their specialization is a bit different. So I've been asking these questions since the very first session. I have no uh, like good or universal answers, but I think that every single Monday evening uh, gave us some 
let's say, material, yeah, to think about it and to, to reflect on our own strategies, like research, presentation, whatsoever strategies. So uh, I hope this one of the most important, let's say, contributions of our colloquium to your own uh, research life and career. Now, dear colleagues, now, finally, it's my great pleasure to introduce our tonight's uh, speaker and the commentator. Uh, so it is our pleasure uh, to have Olena Panko as our guest uh, tonight. Olena, at the moment, is a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow at the University of London. And she holds two PhDs, could you imagine that? So the first PhD in history is from the University of East Anglia. And the second PhD in political sciences is from the Ukrainian National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine in Kyiv. When also just published a book, unfortunately I don't have it here to show you, so just believe me what I'm saying. Uh, the title is Making Ukraine Soviet, Literature and Cultural Politics under Lenin and Stalin. But uh, what is especially important uh, for me and for us, I hope, is that Olena was one of the participants of our Bucharest Winter Academy 2018 under the title of Visiting the Nation Transcultural Contact Zones in Eastern Europe. Um, Olena's talk will be commented by Bozena Kozakevich, whom you know already. Maybe he, it's again a good point to remind you, dear colleagues, that it was our conscious decision to share the moderation. So it was not just me, who was doing it, but all, all, all the members of our steering committee agreed to participate in it. That was really great. I'm so happy about uh, yeah, this type of you know, like equality attitude. So Bozena, uh, she works at the European University of Viadrina, at our chair for Intendant History of Ukraine. And she works on her research project, PhD project on, let me call it this way, on the Soviet religious and nationality policies on the example of the town of Berdyshev, an old, important Jewish, uh, Polish-Ukrainian settlement, if you wish, in central Ukraine. And uh, again, Bozena, like Olena, was also a participant of one of our uh, trans-regional academies. This time it was a summer academy in Dnipro 2019 under the title After Violence, the Impossibility of Understanding and Remembrance. So you see, our Prisma Ukraine Academies is something that, you know, brings people together. Uh, okay, uh, dear Olena, so now the floor is yours. Afterwards, we'll have a comment by Bozena. And please, dear colleagues, you are all, as always, more than welcome to formulate your questions, both in our chat or just live. We're very much looking for the discussion. Um, yeah, let's start, please. So I'm just sharing my screen and I'm navigating to different screens. So uh, one second, can you see it? Because I cannot see now the, yeah, excellent. Um, so yeah. Um, so yes, first of all, um, I would like to thank uh, Professor Andrei Portnov and his team for organizing this uh, online colloquium and bringing together so many wonderful scholars and, and, and discussing so many interesting uh, topics. Unfortunately, I was not able to join every Monday due to my family commitments, but I did follow the, the conversations on demand on YouTube. So this is actually a great, a great opportunity to catch up even if you are not available on Monday evenings. And um, it is my great pleasure and honor to offer a closing talk to this remarkable online season. Um, as uh, Andre uh, mentioned already, um, I will, uh, uh, now I am a Liverpool Early Career Fellow at Birkbeck, University of London. And my today's presentation will be based um, on my uh, postdoctoral project. I would like to summarize some findings obtained during my work and um, my bigger project, uh, which is entitled Contested Minorities and Transnational History of the Polish Soviet Borderlands 1918-1939, which, as Andre mentioned, I have presented the draft uh, proposal to this project I presented in 2018 in Bucharest, um, aims to identify the underlying uh, motives behind the implementation of the minority policies in the Soviet Polish borderland in the interwar period and examine the link between ethnic particularism and foreign policy consideration of the emerging Polish and Soviet government. Um, 
now after three years, uh, kind of past three years after my Bucharest presentation, I'm honored and pleased to discuss some, uh, some of my findings um, on this project. Um, so now let me switch to my presentation entitled Counting Souls and Scribing Nationality, Interpreting Imperial and Early Soviet Nationality Statistics, which I will read given the format. Again, reference to what Andre just said. And the presentation uh, consists of two parts, uh, preceded with a, by a short uh, introduction. First, I will examine the approaches to defining Poles in the Russian Empire, and then I will uh, look at the mechanism of, of constructing ethnic identities employed by Soviet minority specialists. Could you just tell me that I switched the slides? Okay, then everything works. I won't ask again. Uh, no, here. Uh, so, as a result of the three partitions of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth in the late 18th century, the Russian Empire acquired vast territories between the Bug and the Dnieper rivers. The Western Krai, known in Polish historiography as Ziemia Zabrane, or more frequently Zabor Rosyjski, consisted of two administrative units, Northwestern Krai, encompassing the present day territory of Lithuania and Western Belarus, and Southwestern Krai, comprising three general governorates of Kiev, Podolia, and Volhynia, corresponding to the present day right, uh, right bank Ukraine. The Western provinces were home to a large number of Poles who remained loyal to their vanished state. The Polish strong national and separatist movement in the area caused continuous headache to the authorities, especially when we think about two major Polish risings of 1830-31 and 1863-64 that spread throughout the Western provinces and engaged local population across ethnic and confessional lines. The popular tactics to cope with the belligerent Poles was assimilation and Russification, combined with a preferential treatment of weaker national movements, especially those of Polish, uh, of Lithuanian, Belarusian, and Ukrainian. The distrust of Poles remained strong during the early Soviet decades. This sentiment was particularly obvious in Soviet Ukraine, where its Polish population caused a permanent security concern, especially given the support they had offered to their kin state during the brief Polish occupation in 1920. Although the number of the Polish population reduced significantly in the years following the First World War, by the end of the 1920s, the fear of Polish subversion had only increased. Unlike their predecessors, the Soviet leaders did not try to suppress Polish culture, however. On the contrary, the Soviets promoted ethnic self-identification of, the, of their diverse population and guaranteed national rights and freedoms. But grappling with the security dilemma was not the only reason as to why the Bolsheviks attempted to mobilize their minority population. Various minorities were to play an equal part in the process of construction of socialism and the country's modernization. But to modernize backward regions, as it was the case of the Western borderlands, meant to standardize them, to order them by national categories. The Soviet strategy of ethnic proliferation was, therefore, an important constituent of the Soviet modernizing mission. This presentation is based on a close inspection and comparison, and comparison of the quantitative data gathered by imperial ethnographers as well as statisticians and demographers prior and during the first imperial census of 1897 and the Soviet census of 1926 about the Polish population residing on the territory of the present day right bank Ukraine, especially the Podolia and Volhynia Guberni. Um, as this presentation intends to show, Counting subjects and measuring people served multiple objectives. Census could help unify space and population, turning heterogeneous populations into, into neatly defined categories. Statistical data also provided the authorities with the means to evaluate, conceptualize, transform, and control its diverse populations. On the other hand, census helped shape a sense of identity of those counted by making them think and ascertain themselves, themselves in terms of strictly defined and limited categories. Therefore, for all the claims of objectivity, as David Darrow points out, census taking is a political act linked to questions of power and identity. Hence, as I hope to show, counting polls in Russia's West was not a matter of science, but of politics. State interests gained preeminence in the process of gathering, processing, and interpreting the statistical data. As the Soviet strategy of positive discrimination came to replace the imperial ethnic bias, so the tendency to magnify the number of Poles in the Soviet Polish borderlands outplaced the propensity to reduce those. 
That said, I seek to highlight a range of questions on how the category of nationality was conceptualized by imperial and Soviet ethnographers, statisticians and demographers, and how those externally defined rigid ethnic identities were subsequently instrumentalized by the authorities. Instead of scrutinizing nationality as a census category, my task is to investigate how those defined rigid categories corresponded on the realities on the ground. Wait, sorry. As I mentioned earlier, the Russian Empire was the biggest beneficiary of Poland's patricians. More than 60% of territories and almost a half of the Commonwealth population of 14 million found itself within its borders. Nonetheless, a century-long practice of, of, assimila of assimilation blurred ethnic distinctions in the area, making self-determination of one's national and ethnic background particularly difficult. The first attempt to uh, separate national identities belonged to ethnographers who, as demonstrated by Francine Hirsch, played an important role in state-sponsored efforts to celebrate the empire. Perhaps the most important case of one mobilizing ethnographic knowledge for political sake was the ethnographic and statistical expedition to the West Russian region, Zapadnorusky Krai, organized in 1869-1870 by the Royal Geographical Society that was headed by the ethnographer and former Hermada member Pavlo Chubinsky. While the declared aim of the expedition was to chart the ethnic makeup of the region, its motives was to negate the Polish demographic superiority in favor of Little Russians. Indeed, the imperial government sponsored this ethnographic study, hoping that it would provide scientific basis for this region's Russian character and refute the popular view on Russia's Western provinces as Poland and its mobility as Polish. With this in mind, Chubinsky faced the challenge of how to disentangle complex local identities in the region, where language, culture, and religion became especially mixed. The first step was to divorce ethnicity and religion, providing conceptual difference between Catholics and Poles. During the expedition, Chubinsky and his team contrasted existing demographic da data with no census results in hand, they turned to parish books with their own observation of the characteristic elements of everyday life, local customs and habits, and the way of life of the mixed population in the region. Chubinsky asserted that the Catholic denomination did not determine Polish ethnicity. According to the church registers, 390,000 individuals in the regions were recorded as Roman Catholics. Yet how many of those Catholics were actually Poles? For Chubinsky, only Catholic Dvaryania or Szlachta in Polish, and here the quotes are all from the Russian-speaking publication that followed the study, uh, who had preserved their language and the way of life could automatically be regarded as Pole. The rest of the Catholic population, as observed, did not differ in their everyday life from their Orthodox or Little Russian fellows. The close observation of their bid customs and rights allowed Chubinsky to estimate the exact number of Poles in the region. Out of those 390,000 Roman Catholics, only 92,000 were Poles. And in the, in the table on the slide, you can see the correlation. Although, yeah, it's kind of, the methodology might be questionable, but this is how he calculated those people. Chubinsky's conclusion were both necessary and desirable for, for the authorities. Among the total Catholic population of the West Russian region, Poles constituted a, a minority of only 25%, with the remaining 75% of the Catholic population regarded as Little Russians or Russians. Those hybrid identities and intertwined belonging con continued to present a true challenge to the imperial demographers, especially in view of the first imperial census, organized by the Ministry of Interior for both scientific and administrative concerns. Guided by the belief that the imperial subjects had little awareness of their national identity, no direct question on nationality was included in the 1897 census questionnaire. Instead, the ethnic makeup of the empire was defined by a combination of questions on the native language, religion, and social estate, was the Slovene. Nonetheless, as a close inspection examination of the data gathered by experts on the Polish population in the southwestern provinces illustrates, the context of a centralized and authoritarian empire made any objective criteria for nationality, such as language and national belonging, impractical. In the absence of a clearly defined category for nationality, those data obtained were often open for manipulation, error, and abuse, whereby experts, alert by the, of the political necessities, 
gain exclusive power of defining who belongs to what nationality. It was recognized that language was the most useful criteria, criterion for obtaining data on nationality. Nonetheless, transforming the data on language to that on nationality was far from straightforward, with the category of native language itself allowing room for interpretation. The instruction to registrar stipulated the respondents could freely define their native language, thus permitting them to indicate either their mother tongue or the language they use the most, but not both. Therefore, Juliet Cadio maintains that census recorded a sense of a quote, belonging to a particular language, hence culture, end of quote, and not the kinship as projected by census organizers. By the 1897 uh, census, around 8 million people throughout the empire chose Polish as their native language. At the same time, the total population of the former Kingdom of Poland alone accounted for some 9.5 million. The disproportionate number of self-reported Polish speakers was an expected outcome of systematic administrative and linguistic ossification that was a commonplace in the empire. Nonetheless, the language survived, since, as Theodor Wicks um, argues, the Russian administration in the region was less concerned about the language people spoke at home, as long as this non-Russian element did not resist the hegemony of the Russian culture. Given widespread assimilation, the res uh, responses on language needed to be cross-referenced with those on religion, as believed the more durable ethnic marker. In the Russian Empire, there was even an official acknowledged determination between confessional registration and nationality. For instance, the 1903 instruction sent to the governor of Vilna suggested the following equivalents. Orthodox were Russians, Catholics were Poles or Lithuanians, Protestants uh, were Germans, and Judea were Jews. Those equivalents held uh, since the official registration on re of religion up until the 20th century was regarded hereditary. According to the census results, Roman Catholic numbered almost 11 and a half uh, million uh, people, constituting 9.13% of the total population. Based on the above cited by equation, apart from Poles, Lithuanians also belong to the Catholic right. However, even the combined number of Polish and Lithuanian speakers, totaling just about 9 million individuals, left more than 2 million Roman Catholic uncategorized. Large number of those left out were Ukrainian and Belarusian speaking Catholics, who had converted to Catholicism as, uh, at some point during the century long Polish uh, rule. There was yet another religious community that complicated the interpretation of the data on religion gathered in 1897, namely the Uniats. After the patrician of the Commonwealth, more than 3 million of Uniat Greek Catholic Belarusian and Ukrainian believers were incorporated into the Russian Empire. The imperial government had treated the Uniat uh, Church with utmost hostility, forcing its quote unquote return to the Orthodox faith and later reunion with the Russian Orthodox Church. In 1875, the Union of Brest was annulled, leading to mass conversion into Orthodoxy. Needless to say, the 1897 census did not include Uniats, with those believers being often registered as either Catholics, although Ukrainian and Belarusian speakers or Orthodox. The absence of the statistical category did not make unions disappear, however. Wick cites the case of Sedlce province, where the province acting governor complained in 1876 that out of 136,000 Russians of his province, some 20,000 considered themselves uh, themself Catholics. Those confused souls were the former unions who could not reconcile the Orthodox rite and preferred to attend and baptize their children in the Roman Catholic Church. On the other hand, in view of imperial assimilation, as studied by Bohdan Baturk, if some, uh, I quote, some 200,000 reunited believers in the Podlasha, Kyuhon Podlasha region opted for Roman Catholicism and inevitably colonization, end of quote. Statistical data for a particular gubernia allows for a more nuanced understanding of the complexities faced by statisticians when using individual census questionnaires to derive their nationality. In Volinia gubernia, for instance, the census has recorded almost 185,000 individuals, or 6.16% of the gubernia total population who answered Polish to the question to the, of their native language. The number of Roman Catholics stood at almost 300,000, one third of which were Ukrainian speakers. In Podolia Gubernia, there were, also, uh, there were almost 70,000 or 2.3% Polish speakers, 
against 263,000 Roman Catholics, more than 70% of whom were Ukrainian Catholics. Despite the deliberate effort of imperial statisticians and demographers, the results of the 1897 census quickly proved to be inapplicable. Modernization and urbanization of the Russian Empire increased individual social mobility, breaking the restrictive social chains of the estate system. In a, in a similar way, uh, religious categorization became obsolete in view of the edict of religious tolerance signed by Nicholas II of, on 17, 17 April 1905 that removed restrictions on pr uh, practicing religion other than orthodoxy thus granting freedom of consciousness to imperial subjects. Most importantly, the politicization of everyday life split the boundaries, uh, uh, split the population along national lines. As proven by the revolutionary events of 1905-1907, the national questions throughout the empire would no longer be ignored. Nonetheless, until the wake of the war, the urgency of the national categorization remained mostly an academic concern. Instead, in 1914, the language of nationality was adopted by internationalists, socialists, and nationalists alike. The February Revolution of 1917 further advanced the demands for uh, the determination of nationalness, all depending on the author and context, also Narodnost and Nazi. However, it was the Bolsheviks who supported, as well as often constructed, national identities, institutionalized national difference within their former Russian Empire, and used national categories as a formative principle of the new Soviet state. Unlike in um, 1897, uh, the category of narodnost was to become the key determinant of the first Soviet census of uh, 1926. The first question after respondents' personal details, or fourth question overall. As explained, narodnost meant, I quote, tribal origin that is the belonging of a person to a particular ethnic group, end of quote. It is important to highlight that, unlike in 1897, when the Pope and demographers were to interpret the respondent's national identity based on his or language, on, on a language, religion, and social status, the 1926 census was based on subjective self-determination of nationality. The census taker could only intervene when the respondent had problems understanding the question replacing narodnost with native language, religion, grajdanstva, citizenship in the pre-revolutionary sense, or residence in a particular locality. Among other questions recorded by registrars were native language, radno yazik, which could be different to narodnost, place of birth and residence, literacy and in which languages, mental and physical health, occupation and profession, source of income, family status and composition, and so on. In the period between two censuses, the number of polls fell sharply from uh, some 7,900,000 polls based on language in uh, 1897 to 781,700 of polls based on self-defined narodnost in 1926. The main reason for such a drastic decrease was the loss of Western territories, first as a result of the Versailles treaties and second under the 1921 uh, Treaty of Riga, which ended the Polish-Soviet war. Following these international territorial settlements, as Soviet statisticians claimed, 7,400,000 individuals of Polish origins remained on the territory ceded to other countries. If limited to those individuals who had remained within the Soviet borders, the number of self-declared Poles increased by 68%, however, from 5,032,000 ,000 to 782,000, almost half of whom, 476,435 Poles to be precise, resided in Ukraine. And yet, out of the total Polish population, only 46% or 362,000 named Polish as their mother tongue. The results of the census were attributed to the success of the Soviet nationalities and minorities policies that, as claimed, allowed non-Russian population for the first time freely define their ethnic origin that was not tied to the language of their everyday use. So could one suggest that the, this increase was linked to the extreme development of national consciousness of the Polish population in the region aptly defined by Kate Brown as a no place, a borderland zone inhabited by rural, poor, largely illiterate population and hardly any potential for either agriculture or industry. 
or was it the result of a conscious and meticulous effort of Soviet bureaucrats and minorities, specialists who assisted the nationally indifferent population to acquire their ethnic identity? In the Soviet context, Russian population and estimating their ethnic background was not only a statistical exercise. In the early 1920s, ethnic ethnicity became the basis for administrative and economic reform in the Soviet Union. Ronald Sani and Terry Martin defined the 1920s as, I quote, the great era of the territorialization of ethnicity, end of quote, whereby each nationality, no matter how small, was granted the possibility of a self rule in its native language, which extended downward into smaller and smaller territories, the small, smallest being the size of a single village. According to the Ratnarkom, the aim of this reform was to strengthen the lower level Soviet apparatus, thus drawing the Soviet power closer to the local population. In his turn, the Vucevka secretary Andriy Butenko claimed that the formation of separate administrative territorial units for minority nationals served the purpose of engaging them into the Soviet building and reducing the level of ethnic conflict. An, ethnic, an intricate system of village Soviets or Silerade was established throughout Soviet Ukraine. But 1929, 1,089 national village Soviet and 107 town Soviets were in place, including some form for such negligible ethnic groups as Swedes and Albanians. In addition, 26 national districts or rayon were set up, out of which nine were Russian, seven German, four Bulgarian, uh, three Greek, one Polish, and two Jewish. Within, within those national territorial units, the Soviet state strove to provide access to state institutions political representation, police and judicial protection, health care, education, and cultural opportunities in the minority language. In theory, establishing a national Soviet was a grassroots initiative. In villages with mixed population, general meetings were held to discuss poss possible information of independent national Soviets. Local Poles often objected to any plans, plans of such ethnic segregation. For instance, in the village of Horodnyanka, the local pay attention Catholic population, the protocol shows, wished to remain together with the Ukrainians in a single village Soviet. Instead, I quote, if the authorities decide to establish a Polish national Soviet in the village, we will not separate. And if they decide to join the Polish population to another village, we will film, film, firmly reject it, end of quote. The Polish population in the village of Malika Novosalice in Polonna Rayon came to a similar decision. According to the protocol, the delegates wished to express their gratitude to the Soviet authorities for their attention to the minorities question. Nonetheless, and I quote, as for the creation of a separate Polish national Soviet, we, the citizens of Volika Novoselica, are one family with the Ukrainians, with whom we have married over the centuries, and we have no difference with them either in the way we lead our household or in our views. On the contrary, in unity, as one family and in mutual understanding, it would be easier to solve different land disputes and everyday issues. So we have decided that there is no way that we will agree to form a separate Polish Soviet, and we will remain in the same Soviet with the Ukrainians. Even in 1929, local mixed, commu mixed communities were protesting against the possibility of dividing their villages along ethnic lines. During the elections of two local national Soviets that were held based on ascribed ethnicity, some peasants in the village of Mohovata in Kozatan Rayon lamented that, I quote, it, it has never happened before that Poles and Ukrainians were split apart, end of quote. Ukrainians, likewise, opposed the formation of national Soviets, although their considerations were more practical. As highlighted by Martin, the new administrative system often exacerbated fears among those former uh, majorities of losing control over land and possible popular ethnic expulsions. Despite those local concerns, the final decision on the creation of national Soviets rested with the party. In 1924-25, the Butsavaka Central Committee for National Minorities organized an inspection of the ethnically mixed Volinia Gubernia to determine the ethnic composition of each potential Soviet. Overall, some 150 villages were examined, with detailed reports on the region's economic, social, and cultural situation returned to Kharkiv. The language of those reports demonstrated how arbitrary the judgments on whether to establish a Polish national Soviet were. For example, the inspector 
of the Polanyi Rayon in Zhitomir Okrug, Sertan Shoplinski reported that in the village of Novozavodskie, only 20% of the population spoke Polish, yet most could understand and switch if necessary. In the neighboring village of Koshalivka, most locals used Ukrainian and only a few could understand Polish. And in Sosnova Bolyarka, the village that belonged to the Koshalivka Soviet, 30% used Polish on the everyday basis. His recommendation was to make Zdilet, Novozavodsk Soviet, a Polish one, Koshalivka Ukrainian Soviet with a Polish school, and to remove Sosnova Bolyarka from Koshalivka village Soviet and, and make it an independent Polish national Soviet. As of April 1926, there were 129 Polish National Soviets with the total population of 148,502 individuals. In 1925, the first national rayon for Poles was formed in Volinia province, situated some 120 kilometers east from the Polish border. The district was created from, uh, from the villages, village Soviets with predominant Polish population that had been separated out of the Novograd, Volinsky, Baranyuk, Kapulini, Chudny, and Miropol rayon. The Polish National District occupied the area of 65 square kilometer, 650 sorry, uh, square kilometers, with 7,667 households comprising 40,577 inhabitants. Out of those, some 70% were recorded as Poles, 20 Ukrainians, 7 Germans, and 3 Jews. The center of the Polish region was in Dopesh, soon renamed Marchlevs to commemorate late Polish Bolshevik Julian Marchlevsky. The Polish region was established in economically and socially backward area. It was far from the railway, there was no telephone or telegraph. The only industry was a ceramic factory, opened in 1840, that renewed its activity in 1922. By 1925, the area remained predominantly peasant, with 92% of the total population. Literacy was low, 47% for men and 37% for women, and it was only 40% of household collectivized, the lowest out of all national units, which remained the same up until the end of, of, uh, of this uh, rayon. There, Poles received uh, territorial and cultural autonomy. Religious practices for Roman Catholics were allowed, albeit under strict party supervision. The Polish district could boast its own newspaper, Marchlovshizna Radziecka. Moreover, the district had preferential access to state funding to allow for accelerated modernization of the region and its population. Despite those steps, as of April 1926, only 35% of the total Polish population in the Republic belonged to national Soviets. The question is then why Poles, despite being one of the biggest national groups and residing compactly in the western parts of the Republic, were hardly covered enough by the system of national Soviets. The personal matter was among a few factors behind the low engagement of the Polish minority into the Soviet experiment. As reported in April 1926, the Wutsevaka minority committee still had no representative for the Polish section. In addition, the party remained generally weak at the local level. Moreover, the formation of uh, Polish national units was attributed to the lack of data on the exact number of Poles in the region that could only be acquired in the course of field observation. That, of course, required extensive funding. The inspection reports also referred to the fear of the locals to ascertain their nationality, the linguism of the population, and strong local or religious rather than ethnic identities. Unlike Poles, other minority groups were easier to tell apart. Jews were defined by religion and the common experience of movement restrictions. Greeks and Bulgarians by compact settlement in the south of the Republic in distinct language. And Germans, although organized around different religious groups and vernaculars, enjoyed a special autonomous status until the 1880s, which made them more recognizable in the cultural and social terms. Meanwhile, Poles were ambiguous. Language, seen as the key determinant of the national identity, could hardly help disentangle the hybrid identities on the ground. As mentioned above, less than half of the registered Poles declared Polish as their mother tongue, and the language of those who did speak Polish differed significantly from the standard Polish across the border. Instead, as reported, the Polish vernacular, Narecia, used in Soviet Volinia, was very similar to the spoken Ukrainian. In addition, uh, there was no difference in the way Poles and Ukrainians led their households. As one reported detailed, Poles and Ukrainians could only be differentiated in the way they greet each other and their religious practices. 
The imperial legacy of assimilation posed a great challenge to the Bolshevik plan. In the village of Bobrista Balyanka, almost 90% of the total population of uh, 795 were recorded as Poles, although only one fourth of those used Polish for everyday communication. Whereas in Burtyn, Polish National Soviet, in Polonna Rayon, there were no Polish speaking, speakers altogether. When asked elsewhere why people would use Ukrainian instead, some answered that it was a habit and that they didn't know that, I quote, such freedom for the Polish language existed, end of quote. Same goes for the distinction between religion and nationality, with all Catholics routinely being regarded as Poles. For example, in the village of Horodysha in Shepetivka Okrug, only 5% of population could, could tell nationalness from religion, that is Polish from Catholic. In other instances, however, Roman Catholic answered Ukrainian to the question of their nationalness, explaining that, I quote, Poles lived in Poland, end of quote, and that they were Catholic Ukrainians. One villager ironically challenged the party inspector, asking him, I quote, a man born uh, in a stable, uh, if the man born in a stable should be called a horse, end of quote, implying that all those born in Ukraine were Ukrainians by definition. The terminological confusion was, uh, was caused, this terminological confusion was caused by the lack of clear, centrally defined criteria on who should be defined as a pope. In their absence, local bureaucrats applied their own understandings. In practice, within the region of Proskuria, it looked as follows. Yarmolin Tserik, or Rayon Executive Committee, counts as Poles only those born in Poland. Bakhmativ Tserik, all those who don't speak Ukrainian. Felstein Rik, in addition to the language, takes into account the level of Polish self-consciousness or samosaznanie in the Catholic villages. The village of Oleshkivci is purely Polish, Felstinska Juridika, also Polish, but more Ukrainian, Ukrainianized. Uh, Kudrinci half Poles, because they speak Ukrainian at home, but demand a Polish language school. And Klemkivci, Ukrainian Catholics. They speak solely Ukrainian at home and do not demand the Polish school. To make matters worse, uh, few of those assumed Poles define themselves as such. In the village of Oleshkivci in Felstin Rayon, Poles called themselves Mazuri, the descendants of uh, Hlopwe, uh, or peasants from Mazuri region in Poland, calling their vernacular Hopski in contrast to the Polish language of Szlachta. While those Poles in the village of Novostalitsy in Polonna Rayon called themselves Mazuni, referring to the, their previous belonging to the landowner named Mazu. Same as in 1897, those in the middle, Ukrainian Catholics, posed the biggest challenge. Their national identity mattered since, the, since depending on the categorization, these people were to be subjected either to Ukrainization policies as a titular Ukrainian nation or to the minorities policies as Poles. For the Ukrainian lobby, Ukrainian Catholics were Polonized by the Catholic Church Ukrainians, whereas for the Polish lobby, they were Poles assimilated under, under the Tsarist autocracy. And unfortunately, in Soviet statistics, one could not belong to two categories at the same time. When advocating the Ukrainian interest, Butsenko in 1924 explained that Ukrainian Catholics should be barred from joining Polish National Village Soviets. As a basis, the language used in the private setting of Bitu should be used. Following this approach, in Proskurim Okrug, the number of Poles among Roman Catholics was largely underestimated. Whereas in Kamenets Okrug, local bureaucrats completely discarded any minority programs, claiming that there were no Poles whatsoever. The minority specialists intervened. They condemned such approach employed by certain local executive committees as, I quote, wrong and dangerous, end of quote. Apart from these single cases, the minority specialists had an upper hand in this identity battle. It is self to assume that the increase in the number of Poles in Ukraine, as reported by the 1926 census, was due to the recategorization of those Ukrainian Catholics as Poles. In terms of one particular village of Starasenyava, the change was from 20 Poles and 2006 Ukrainian Catholics in 1924 to 2,325 Poles and no Ukrainian in 1925. As explained before, people were afraid of their identity, but I quote, now the Polish population is flourishing thanks to our nationality politics. And the number um, in 1920 is 300,009, 800 Poles, 
22% of whom are definitely Poles in reference to those who spoke, spoke the Polish language. Thereafter, minority specialists work tirelessly to promote Polish and teach their native language to those classified Poles. Numerous Polish language schools, reading huts, and literacy rooms in the Polish language were established. Crash language courses for governmental employees were launched and pedagogical institutes set up to prepare teachers and educators. It was mainly due to the need of imperial and Soviet statisticians and bureaucrats that those people who lived side by side for generations needed to define themselves and as opposed to whom. In the Russian Empire, ethnographic knowledge served for academic and ideological purposes mostly, helping the imperial authorities to reclaim the Western borderlands as Russian lands. In contrast to the imperial practices, the Soviet leaders relied on ethnic categories to draw administrative and internal borders, believing that those lines would be more durable than those drawn according to the physical factors and economic considerations. Thereafter, the entire success of the socialist project relied heavily on the authorities' ability to neatly classify population along class and ethnic lines. With the introduction of Soviet passports in December 1932, the category of nationalness became one of the basic information uh, written in Soviet personal identification documents. According to Mar Martin, the modern Soviet strategy of ethnic stratification and ethnic labeling turned the impersonal category of nationality into, into, I quote, a valuable form of social capital, end of quote, that ascribed a status, a modern equivalent of the traditional status of the Soviet divisions. But as this presentation sought to demonstrate, the minimum criteria for Polishness was far from clear, hence easy to manipulate and twist in accordance with the demand of the time. As Brown aptly summarized, I quote, to be Polish in a Soviet and proletarian setting was a, a yet unwritten text, while to be Polish in the old way, religious, aristocratic, bourgeois, had become a crime, end of quote. Thank you for your attention and looking forward to your questions and comments. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Sorry, can I stop the, the slide sharing? Yes, 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 okay. that's right. Now, Thanks. dear colleagues, dear colleagues, uh, don't forget about yeah, your questions and comments. As I've just said, you could, uh, you could just put them, write them down in our chat or do it uh, by yourself, <laughs> which is probably preferable. Uh, but before that, of course, we'll give a floor to uh, Bojana Kozakevich uh, to her comments. I think it, it's pretty obvious for us now how important this issue, not just important, how I would say how difficult this issue is, because we are often used to talk about, you know, peoples who are nationally like name it, Polish, Jewish, Ukrainian, Russian, whatever, even though, first of all, these notions are usually truly new, quite often uh, they were introduced by the Soviet regime, as we've just learned, and uh, in other words, we always need to contextualize them. And that's a fascinating task indeed. So, uh, dear Bozena, the floor is yours, and then we'll discuss all together our presentation, please. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, and of course, thank you very much, uh, Olena, for your thought-provoking uh, presentation on such an important and uh, fascinating issue. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I feel very honored to comment on your presentation. Uh, my very short comment uh, will be based on the article uh, Olena sent to me, uh, as well as on the presentation itself. Um, I really enjoyed reading this fascinating and innovative paper. I will begin with a personal remark and then go on to some, in my opinion, very significant ideas of the article uh, and will finish with some comments on possible supplements uh, to this topic. Uh, <clears throat> This paper takes a close uh, look uh, at the statistic regarding the Polish minority in 1897 uh, and 1926. As it was formulated in the article itself and uh, today's presentation, uh, the paper sets out uh, to analyze uh, how the category of nationality uh, was uh, conceptualized uh, and uh, instrumentalized by authorities uh, in the late Russian Empire and uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, 
I will allow myself to begin with a personal comment. Um, I must admit that I'm very grateful for your attention to this uh, topic. Every time I'm asked about the ethnic uh, composition of Berdechev, uh, a town about which I'm doing my research, I feel uh, myself uncomfortable uh, with just reproducing the state data, uh, whether of the census of 1897 or the Soviet census. However, there is not always time to elaborate why this data is so problematic. Uh, now, I just may refer to your article. Um, it seems to me that it is enormously important to question all state documents and census uh, are no exception. Uh, as you have shown uh, and uh, in your article and also today in your presentation, um, counting polls in Russians or Soviet West was not a matter of science, but of politics. Uh, by analyzing the role of, uh, <clears throat> of census takers and experts in gathering and uh, compiling the data on the minority population in the late imperial and early Soviet context, you explore how the category of nationality was understood and how its meaning uh, changed in between the uh, sen um, censuses. It seems uh, obvious to me that behind every um, state act had some attention. Uh, the late Russian imperial minority policy and the Soviet nationality policy are analyzed uh, through the logic of conceptualization, intention and carrying out of the census. I am very excited about the part of your article where you elaborate the ethnic dimension of administrative reform in Soviet Ukraine. Uh, it illustrates, besides the logic and motivation behind this reform, also the relations between Poles and Ukrainians. Um, I would emphasize, I would say, this um, good neighborhood uh, relations more, especially with a focus on foreign policy. Um, I mean, this point seems very important to me. Ukraine and Polish conflicts in Western, uh, in Eastern Poland to the time are more known and they dominate the imagination about Ukrainian Polish relations. As uh, the Soviet case uh, tell us uh, a completely different story um, and to my mind, it uh, should be more elaborated, at least in this, uh, with this, um, examples uh, you have in your article, uh, it is uh, as a relation as it is in, um, in case of um, Eastern Poland. And of course, for us historians, it's pretty clear why so, uh, even because the different history uh, and different uh, minority policies in uh, Russian empire and uh, in uh, um, and in uh, Habsburger monarchy, but still uh, maybe we could mention it somehow in this article. Um, I would like to, uh, to share uh, with you the other idea, which came to my mind. I hope it won't be too difficult and too entangled <laughs> what I thought. Um, uh, the, fir the, the first matter is uh, to scroll on from our discipline. It's quite obvious why you focus in your paper on the Polish minority, but um, I mean, uh, for us here, it's pretty clear, but for, uh, it is uh, more common to your article. Maybe um, it's important to explain in the beginning of your article uh, why um, uh, why do you focus uh, on Polish minority and not on some other um, cases. Um, at this point, I have two small questions. You describe precisely the difficulties in defining the distinction between Poles and Ukrainians. Um, and wasn't it difficult to distinguish between Poles and Russians, for instance, in the cities? Uh, this matter we don't have in, uh, I, I didn't uh, read it in your article. Uh, besides this question, I'm curious about the following matter. Um, and it is the point, uh, maybe too entangled, but uh, I'm still interested in, in, in your paper, you mentioned uh, the policy of Russification towards the Polish minority in the Russian empire. Um, however, by demonstrating the logic of administrative reform and its ethnic dimension, uh, you show that many people who determinate themselves as Poles in the first Soviet census were Ukrainian native speaker um, and, no, uh, and not Polish uh, or Russian. 
Can we say that uh, this imperial Russification policy resulted in case of the Polish minority uh, in the previous Western territory, territories in Ukrainization and not in Russification? Um, it's maybe a little bit provocant, uh, but still. And uh, the last thought I would like to share is about the foreign policy circumstances. Uh, you mentioned uh, in the conclusion the influence of the foreign policy situation uh, on the nationality policy toward, towards Soviet Poles. Uh, it seems to me to be a very important point. Um, and maybe um, you could think about put it in somewhere earlier in the text, because for me, it explains in case of Polish minority, um, a lot of this um, conceptualization and also this administrative reform and trying to find more polls, uh, even this uh, foreign situation, this uh, compare, and, and you mentioned it in your article, but maybe it would be good to mention it somewhere on, on more prominent um, um, part of your article. And <clears throat> the last question I have um, doesn't uh, directly refer to your article. It is more about possible uh, continu um, continuation of your research. Um, have you maybe thought uh, about um, focusing your research not only on the Pol Polish question, Polish minority, uh, but maybe to extend it and to analyze changes in Ukrainian and Russian population? I know that it isn't a matter of uh, this article, but maybe you have some thoughts uh, to extend your research like on some other point. Uh, yes. And uh, to sum up, I'm uh, really looking forward to your article to be published. Thank you very much. Very good, very good. Thank you. Thank you, dear Bozena. Now, dear colleagues, we are all thinking about our own questions and comments. And of course, we give Olena a chance to respond uh, to some points raised. So please, the floor is yours. Just wanted to, to check the, 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 the book reference that I wanted to, to use in this. Uh, um, yeah, so let me, I'll, I'll, I'll remember. So um, what I wanted to say, uh, thank you, Bojana. It's all very interesting questions. And uh, definitely I agree, like in general, that I need more context, like especially on, on, the, on the foreign uh, policy and foreign consideration, because definitely this is one of the main Kind of consideration why even they decided to promote Poles, right, as opposed to, to the kind of assimilation of Ukrainians and Belarusians across the border. So this was like one of the tactics to to sort of attract people or Ukrainians across the border. And this is definitely one of the very important uh, um, kind of mo motives in the in, in the Soviet politics. And and I, I will definitely elaborate on that. Um, I actually uh, was uh, thinking about the cities. I think, yes, I don't really talk about the cities because I think uh, um, in cities, I, I haven't checked because like my, my, my uh, sources were kind of mostly on, on you know, this, this uh, Volinia province that is mostly um, kind of peasant and agricultural and cities are not that prominent, like less urbanized area. Uh, but I would think that in cities, uh, the kind of self-consciousness of people was higher than in, in the rural areas, and perhaps this was easier to differentiate. But um, I didn't include it in my presentation. But uh, in the in the article where I have all those like tables, extensive tables, uh, where I tried to, to look at, at uh, those censuses like in more details, it kind of shows the difference between years and, and cities. So it's kind of you can see that there were uh, more poles speaking Ukrainian or kind of Poles speaking Ukrainian in villages than those kind of Poles speaking Polish in cities. So I think it's kind of the, the, um, the yeah, kind of, we can say that this is this self-consciousness or national awareness, but I think it's also linked to access to education, uh, publications and so on, that which was not or less was the case in, in the rural areas. And um, what I wanted to say about this Russification, this your provocative point about that resulted in Ukrainization. And I think this is definitely the case. And I was just trying to find this, this book, uh, The Paradox of uh, Ukrainian Lviv. Uh, Andri, help me, who's the author? Um, uh, Tariq Amar. Yes, yes. Uh, so he, he exactly, he has this point saying that um, 
the Sovietization of Lviv after the Second World War was achieved via Ukrainization, right? So I think it's, it's, it's kind of Russification meant to assimilate Poles, but it, defend, it depended on the region. And um, sometimes I also think I wanted to kind of answer these questions uh, with an anecdote. Um, when I was also <laughs> reading, <laughs> like when you read a lot about, you know, kind of those scholarly concepts and, and, and the context and conceptualization of, of uh, for instance, Soviet Russification in, in uh, you know, kind of uh, after the Second World War, I also felt that everyone spoke Russian, even in Ukraine. And then I myself from kind of the region, from Shepetivka, and then once I asked my grandmother, asking, what language did you speak, you know, back then in the 60s? And she looked at me like surprised, said, the same as we speak now. So this kind of, you know, Russification and all those policies, they did not necessarily kind of affect, you know, people's everyday life. So I think kind of what I want to say with this, that uh, in those areas which were more sort of Ukrainian, if we can say Ukrainian speaker speaking, there was this, uh, this vernacular like Narechi or, or whatever we can call it, the mixture of languages. This was the language that people assimilated into, not necessarily the Russian, but at the same time, um, this is the same with kind of conversion from Roman Catholicism to Orthodox. If you wanted a position, you needed to speak Russian, you needed to be an Orthodox and so on. So I think it depends on kind of the level, or not maybe the level, but the, yeah, the level where you are and, and how this assimilation affects you, what you assimilate into basically. So thank you for your, this question. And uh, yeah, the, the extent of Ukrainian and Russian population, I was thinking about it. And, and this is why when I was looking at this, the comparison between the censuses, I also included the Ukrainian and Belarusian population, because obviously if one increases, another needs to decrease, right? You sort of, but, <laughs> but I, I still need to look into it. So, so this is a definitely like kind of, when you think about this recategorization, who was recategorized at kind of at expense of whom? And this is definitely something to look into. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much again. Because exactly, dear colleagues, let us be aware of the fact that uh, in Soviet uh, pretty restricted statistical approach, there was no chance to have like both options or to be in between. You should be either Polish or Jewish or Russian. Nowhere to be Polish Russian or Jewish Ukrainian. Absolutely. And that's, of course, a big trouble for us nowadays, for researchers, yeah, how to get into some complexes. Now, dear colleagues, we are coming to my favorite part of every colloquium <laughs> questions and answers. Um, so we have Tobias, right? As the first, and Catherine, perfect. So, Tobias, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I was wondering if, uh, thank you for your presentation, by the way, it was very, very interesting. Um, uh, and I was wondering if you're also looking at or have considered looking at um, observations by Ukrainian nationalists uh, during the occupation, um, during the German, the Second World War. Um, because of course, they, most of them came from um, the former Habsburg, territories and had very different ideas about what it meant to be Polish or what it meant to be Ukrainian uh, from the Polish Republic, of course, so, as well. Um, and they write about this very often, I've noticed. Um, and I, I even have this example from um, Mikhailo Seleshko, or Seleshko, who was in Vinitsa during the war. Um, and he describes talking to a local woman who says she's Polish, and then he asks her some questions, and then he explains to her that she's actually Ukrainian, and she's like, okay, well, then I'll be Ukrainian, um, which is, of course, a very good um, historical example of mansplaining. Um, <laughs> but I think it's also interesting to, um, uh, yeah, to, to, because I think it also says something about not about his, only about his perceptions of what it means to be Ukrainian or Polish, but also about Soviet perceptions of what it means to be. Um, and I could also add perhaps um, that it might be worthwhile looking at the memoirs of uh, Vladimir Korolenko, who I think people don't read in Ukraine anymore, uh, but he was from a Russian Ukrainian, no, a Russian Polish family in Volynia, um, but he also grew up speaking Ukrainian, actually more than Russian, uh, and he has some very interesting um, 
thoughts and observations about this. So that's it from me. Shall I respond? Oh, yeah. So I wanted to say, if I remember correctly, and if it's the same Karolenko, then I think we did, if it's the writer, then I think we read him because I know the name. I cannot remember the sh like the stories that were, but he is, or he used to be at the curriculum. I don't know how it is now, but if it's the same Karolenka, I don't know. So anyway, um, then I wanted to say uh, regarding um, this question about Ukrainian nationals in the Second World War, this is beyond the scope of my research because I'm mainly focused on the interval period. And for me, like as, as, as Bojana said, when I was started looking, you know, when you kind of quote the statistics. So this article was the, my way of answering the question, who, who is behind those numbers, right? In 1926, when I speak about all those polls and, and, and uh, like the minority policies and so on and so on. And then I kind of started looking at, at census and the Soviet census and then the reference to the imperial census. So then I started thinking about, so what about the imperial census? So this is, was like, you know, kind of the way of trying to find answers for, for, answers for myself. And uh, the Second World War is, is, is definitely beyond the scope of this, my research. But um, what, well, while you were asking your questions, I was thinking about, you know, those, um, this, the, this, this concept of national indifference. And when we read uh, those works, when they say that those kind of nationally indifferent population or hybrid identities, they were problems only for those national awakeners because they needed to appeal to one population, right? And people, if they are in between, you know, how, how, like, kind of, whom do you appeal to, right? Or again, like, if you think about those statisticians, how do you categorize them? So I think it's not the people, the problem of the people on the ground, but those who are trying to, you know, sort of differentiate the people. So then the problem kind of arises when you want to, yeah, categorize them, then you need to say you are this and not this. And I was actually thinking another something that came to my mind, um, in one of the articles or presentations by Andrea, our colleague, uh, Erico Noble, he was referring to Felix Kohn, who in different documents had, uh, you know, different ethnic ethnicities. He was a Jew, a Polish, a Russian. So it depended on the, on the kind of questionnaire or enquieta and the, you know, and the, and the addressee. Oh, uh, yeah, so it's kind of, he was writing different identities on the demand of the time. So I think it's, it's still, um, yeah, I'm kind of not very comfortable with, with these rigid identities. And this is, I think, when we try to take them as given, then this is a problem that comes. But at the same time, I understand, like as Bajana said, you don't really have time to go into details and problematize the statistic all the time. So you do use it, right? But uh, yeah, so yeah, this is if it's an answer to your question. Sorry, it's, yeah, it didn't, didn't really have to say much on, on, on your actual question, but yeah, thanks. Very good, thank you so much. So let us briefly clarify the Korolenko issue. So we have a comment from Denise Horbach. Thank you so much, dear Denise. There is a quote from Rosa Luxemburg I'm not going to read, uh, but I just want to like use this opportunity, thanks to Tobias, great. Uh, that's exactly the deep the colloquium to uh, invite all of us to reread uh, Korolenko's uh, diaries because they are just great sources of the revolution and civil war in Ukraine, because Kremlenka has spent those years mostly in Poltava region. So it's like, how to call it, like central, yeah, southern central Ukraine, I don't know. So in Poltava, he even died in Poltava in 1921. Um, but of course, we should also be aware that uh, he was and he still is considered to be a Russian writer. Okay, so he was a Russian and Russian language writer living in Ukraine, yeah, with this complicated Polish and whatever origin. So fascinating person to think about and to include into our research. Now, we have a question from Catherine David uh, from the United States. So please, Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, so much for this presentation. Um, I wanted to ask a bit about uh, religion uh, and you talk, uh, I was interested in sort of, especially in the Soviet, uh, the, the part of the talk we talked about the Soviet census about sort of these Catholics who wanted to identify um, as Ukrainian. Um, and I was interested in sort of how the Soviet census takers approached 
religion in this moment and whether there was sort of an effort to get people to stop identifying with, with re their religious communities through sort of this overall drive to, to get people to sort of think of themselves more nationally and not, um, not as, as religious and as they were sort of closing down a lot of these religious communities at the time and arresting people, um, especially once you get into the late 1920s. So I was interested in just how the Soviet census takers approached um, approached religion as a category um, as they were trying to minimize religion in, in everyday life. Um, thank you. This is, this is a very good question, especially since I'm, I'm now working on another article, another text on the Soviet attitudes to, to Roman Catholic uh, priests. And um, so I'm also kind of, I was thinking about it because again, we have this preconception that uh, Soviets were very much against religion. And in the, in the early 1920s, it seems that they were trying actually, same as with ethnic identities, they were trying to use religious identities, right? For their, for their benefit. It was not yet the complete, you know, eradication of religion. Um, they didn't close all churches and forbade all, all kind of, you know, religious cults and so on. But there was this, this attempt to find a way to make religion work in their favor. And this was the case with the Catholic priests whom they were trying to convert, to speak against Poland, to speak against Vatican and so on and so on. Uh, so it's kind of based on this. I think that, that um, this is why obviously they were trying to push, you know, the, 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 the category of nationality you know, about any like language, religion and so on. But at the same time, especially in the 1926 context, religion was there and it was strong, right? So you cannot not, you know, take it into account. But at the same time, uh, so you, so this was like, there were, the question was what to do with those Catholics, right? They didn't want them or kind of on the one hand, some people didn't want them to be Ukrainians, but on the other hand, they didn't want them to be Poles. And the, the, this equation between Catholic is, is a pole is still strong nowadays, right? So it's something that survives saying that the Catholic church is a Polish church and, church and, and that's it, right? So I, I think that kind of in answer to your question, I think that um, I would say that uh, they just took it as given, um, but prioritizing other, other issues, you know, until the point that religion perhaps will become kind of wither away with kind of people, you know, with, with Sovietization and modernization, people would be less and less religious. But at the same time, again, in the context of 1926, Roman Catholic Church was very important, like still kind of present and important because by the, uh, by the uh, Treaty of Riga of 1926, wait, 1921, the Soviet Union kind of, you know, they, 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 they um, promised to respect Roman Catholics and, and not take their property. And so obviously they were taken because their property, because they were saying that the, this, uh, the Treaty of Riga is one thing, but the Soviet constitutional legislation is a different thing. But still they kind of acknowledged that they would need to allow them the freedom of, uh, of, of religion um, and so on. So I think there was like a lot of this, and this is again, coming back to Bojana's comment that then this foreign context, foreign policy consideration is very important in this regard. And if I speak about Poles, I need to take it kind of to make it more prominent to show how their attitude or treatment of the Polish minority, regardless language wise or culture wise or religion in terms of religion, how it sort of corresponded to their you know, kind of relations with with Poland and and those uh, yeah kind of international treaties and and uh, and uh, and yeah and and then just sorry I'm kind of thinking while talking and there was also another consideration of that in the early 1920s the Soviet Union was trying to get out of this international isolation right and uh, like that you know they found themselves uh, themselves in during the civil war so it was also an attempt to sort of show that with the Catholic Church, they were persecuting sort of um, spies and, and foreign agents, but they did ha had nothing against uh, Catholic priests as such. And actually in this, in this article that I'm working on, there are a lot of, of uh, even kind of newspaper articles when they say, you know, this kind of Soviet propaganda articles, when they say, uh, people help us to uh, make those priests serve as, you know, kind of for religious purposes and not to be spies. So kind of, 
give us, you know, the spies, but keep the priests. And this is, you know, the, how they, they were, obviously there were a lot of, you know, abuses and so on and so on. We cannot say that they were sort of, you know, tolerant towards religion, but if it's clear what I'm saying, that, that there were always, you know, this, this pro between propaganda and reality and foreign consideration, one needs to find a way how, how to understand their attitudes and treatments of Polish minority, but at the same time, uh, Catholics. Thanks. Thank you so much. And yeah, I just, the foreign policy aspect where it's not just with Poland, but it's with the Vatican as well. So that kind of coming out is really interesting. So thank you for, the, for that answer. Great. Who's next, dear colleagues? Maybe our students, because, you know, the best questions, they're always from the students, as we know. Okay. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm not missing anyone here <laughs> mm -hmm. okay no <laughs> okay that's 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 a big challenge also to me to think whether it's a sign that um uh, probably so that Olena already um, uh, raised and touches upon so many complicated issues that it's more or less clear to us what we are talking about and what the research should be about. Uh, maybe we're just a bit yeah, tired um, because the semester is officially over. Um, so dear colleagues, if, if there are no more questions, maybe some final question, a comment will come up, then let me do something that I've planned uh, to do in the very end. Maybe it will not be the very end, we'll see. Adrian, uh, so, oh, uh, Andrew, yeah. sorry, there is a question. I think Valerie. Finally, think... great, very sorry. good. That's great. So please, Valerie, we are, we, the, yeah, yeah, the floor is yours. You should just turn your microphone on. It's uh, actually, it's not a question. It's, not, it's just a comment. It's very, very good. It's very complicated for me because I'm French <clears throat> and in France, uh, the idea is quite different. The policy in French is to regard every people as French and not to, 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 to give a nationality to people. As far as I'm concerned, I know that my ancestor came from Africa. Of course, you can see my skin colors, but I don't regard, I don't consider myself as an African woman, but completely as a French woman, because my, uh, so my ancestor came from Africa centuries ago. That's the reason why I couldn't understand <laughs> why people regard themselves, from, even if they live in another, in the same country, why they regard themselves as foreigners. Very complicated for me. But thank you very much for your presentation. It was very enriching. But I'm very sorry not to ask you a question because I must to think of her. It. It's a real, real complicated point for me. And so sometimes it's very difficult for me to tell the difference between Ukrainian, between Polish. And it's also very complicated for me to label people according to religion, to see that people are regarded as a Jews. I remember something, for instance, uh, speaking of uh, a filmmaker of uh, uh, Polanski, uh, is regarded as a Polish a police maker, but even if his family came from a, a, as a Jewish origin, I think that it's a, just like a lottery. You win or you don't win. It's a, something which is not, a, a, it's not rational. It's a really in, in the mind of the people, I think. It's a question of nationality is very intricate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I just kind of maybe respond to this comment. I, I think it's like definitely and actually um, 
when when uh, you know kind of presenting on this sort of ethnicity or or nationality you know in the in the western context to non kind of slavis or whatever non non soviet uh, or non kind of, kind of, kind of, uh, soviet studies people it's actually difficult to explain how the difference between nationality and citizenship is is very you know deeply sort of ingrained in our consciousness and it's and it's it's interesting and also it's like an anecdote i know that in britain they would ask me not where i'm from but where my accent is from because i can as well be british right and and this is enough but my accent can be coming like from somewhere else it's not my nationality or ethnicity like as you say you can be french but at the same time speak different languages religions and so on and this is was perhaps one of the of the um inventions of the Soviet uh, Soviet Union and the Soviet passports when they classified people uh, by you know nationality and put it in the passport you could be a citizen of Soviet Ukraine but a Polish by nationality and and this was like a confusion in so it was clear in the Soviet context but I think it's not clear to those who grew up in in Western con- uh, context but this is actually what I wanted to say is also interesting when for kind of based on this Soviet understanding, Jewishness is also a, real, a, a nationality. And you cannot say something like this to a Western person because they, for, for them it's only religion. So it's kind of this Soviet um, creation construct that Jews were the same as Poles, Ukrainians and so on, a nationality and not, and not religion, for instance. Uh, but also, it's, it was also very interesting to me when I was reading those primary sources and the one quote that I said when a person said, like a Pole is the one who lives in Poland and I'm Ukrainian because I'm born in Ukraine. So it seems that this civic understanding of, we can say nationality or, or, or identity was already there even in the 90s, 1920s. But like, you know, the authorities were trying to, to, to make use of the categories that they wanted to kind of, you know, create. But thank you for your comment, yes. Um. Now, dear colleagues, on the one hand, uh, we have one extra question, which is good. On the other hand, uh, we are coming to an end, unfortunately. Uh, so, first of all, actually, I think Valerie's question or comment uh, is very relevant. It's about the general contextualization of this entire topic, because you see, uh, very seriously thinking about it, uh, we should be aware that on the one hand, the very word nationality, yeah, it came to Russian as well as Ukrainian language, actually from French. And it came in the context of the French Revolution and its incredible impact on the Eastern Europe, on the one hand. On the other hand, this word became something very different in Russian, Ukrainian, Polish context, which is interesting. Yeah, so in other words, nationality and ethnic origin. And please think about it, like dear students and dear colleagues, think about it. Theoretically, at least theoretically, those early Bolsheviks, Lenin and the guys, they could have decided to implement this French model saying that every single person in our new country, it's a new world, yeah, is Soviet and nationality Soviet, but they never did it. Think about it. Instead of saying your own Soviet doesn't matter anymore, they said, no, 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 your own Soviet citizens, but we'll find out who you are in ethnic terms. And that is really incredible and so, of course, different from the, let's say, ideals of the French Revolution. But that's exactly one of the, let's say, keys to the history of the region. And uh, yeah, we should be aware, <laughs> should be very critical about it. Now, 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 dear colleagues, first of all, we have, oh, moment, moment, moment. Now we have, now, now we finally have questions. So I have one question in the chat I'm going to read. And then of course, we'll give a floor to Anushka Bodenman. Okay, so very, very briefly. So it's from Ivan Kozachenko from Kharkiv. So he thanks uh, us, you, Umena, for the interesting presentation. And he wonders whether you considered a deeper quantitative analysis in order to see correlations. Uh, for instance, ethnic identity and class. Now, I would suggest to listen to Anushka's question as well, and you respond to all of them, Umena, right? Okay. So, yeah, please, so the floor is yours. So my question is maybe, um, it's more an understanding question. 
because as much as I understand that the concept of nationality was working to have at the same time a Soviet identity and another uh, ethnic identity, I have a hard time understanding why they did not allow people to not only have one, uh, not, or not only have one identity, but rather multiple. Um, why was it not, for example, possible to be at the same time Soviet Ukrainian and Jew? Uh, Jewish. This is something that is confusing me a lot. Um, I find it even even a bit interesting because it does not reflect the reality so much since everybody is basically a mix of something somehow. And I was just wondering why they didn't do this extra step. What did they stop to one fix extra nationality? That is my question. So maybe quickly to the um... This, uh, the correlation between uh, ethnic identity and class. Uh, I did kind of look at, at in the Soviet, con in, the, in the imperial context, because you can also, in the statistics, you, could, you can see how many kind of poles you can see by category, like, uh, you know, Mishani and Varyani and so on and so on. So you can kind of see the correlation, but in the Soviet statistics, it, it's, it's less so. They were, they, obviously there is an occupation. Uh, so I could maybe look into it as well. I haven't, I haven't really, because, I was, this is to the question of um, uh, Ivan Kozachenko. Yes, yeah. so um, I need perhaps, yeah, maybe kind of to cross reference with other uh, ethnicity and class because both at the same time in the 1920s were equally important. And uh, at some point, uh, kind of they, they, they converged when we look at in, in the 1930s and, and the ethnic terror, then being a kulak was sometimes equal to be in a pole or, or the other way around. So it's kind of those, those uh, identities, they, they, yeah, they converged basically. Um, and as to your question, um, I was, so maybe I should, this is another kind of layer of context that one needs to add when speaking about those uh, nationality, like nationalities and, uh, and minorities uh, pol policies in the Soviet context that uh, there are a lot of different you know approaches to explain why they didn't e like why did they go into such lengths with creating or constructing those ethnic identities when you know in in the end they still wanted all people to be you know soviet kind of soviet in terms of values not necessarily in terms of language but uh, i kind of side with with francin hirsch who says that uh, this was like you know a double uh, the process of double assimilation first you assimilate into your culture and then you assimilate into the Soviet uh, values. But in order to understand and learn Soviet values, you need to kind of learn them through your language because it's easier. If you are already a say you, Ukrainian speaker, it's easier to learn communism in, through Ukrainian language rather than through Russian. Although in the end and later on in the 1920s in the Ukrainian context, there is a lot of this kind of discussions among elites, you know, so um, like, what do you mean by Sliyanya, like kind of the, the, the incorporation, like will Russian become the only language? Will it become, you know, the kind of Soviet equal Russian or not? And they are kind of questioning con constantly, what is the future of national cultures and national languages? But the Soviet response was this famous Stalin um, formula of uh, national in uh, form, but Soviet or socialist in content. So that the values are socialist, no matter the language, right? No matter the framing. The framing was there to facilitate the learning or kind of the indoctrination or yeah, kind of getting those values closer to the people. But the language was there to help them acquire those values quicker, basically, to learn communism through native languages. If it makes sense, yeah. Okay, that's a, that's a really complicated uh, question, and it's still a, a debatable topic, of course. But it's really fascinating, I think, because if we do understand properly what was it about, we really like have some deep understanding of this entire Soviet project. Yeah, which is quite often uh, stereotypically described as, you know, like internationalist, yeah, purely, which is not true, which is not exactly the point. It was much more complicated and uh, contextualized. And um, yeah, as we know, this idea of one obligate, obligatory, obligatory, ethnically defined uh, nationality, it remained in force till the very end, yeah, till 1991. And only in post-Soviet countries, in some of them, 
we have this um, like attempt to approach the issue differently. For instance, not to have nationality and ethnic origin written down in your internal passports or documents like that. But again, it's a fascinating question. What happened to this, let's say, post-Soviet understanding of nationality? Again, in Russia, in Ukraine, in Kazakhstan, and so, so on. It's really... It's really a huge issue. Okay, so I am very happy. I'm very grateful to you, Olena, you see, for provoking so many thoughts. That, that's great. So now let's hope for all of us will be more, will be like more careful, yeah? And um, uh, in dealing with this uh, topic, which is already, you know, a lot, which is already a lot. Now, what I'd like to tell you, dear colleagues, if we may, in the very end. So I hope, I hope that at least some of you, all of you, of course, all of you, all of us, that all of us, are interested in the future uh, of this colloquium, at least. Okay, when it comes to the future, I want to say historians in the future, it is always dangerous because I believe that uh, we and me myself and we we should really like you know we should uh, stand against the temptation uh, to tell that we know it. We know the future, it will be this and that. Of, co of course, we don't know, we never know. But what we know more or less for sure, and what I'm trying to say you now, so it seems, uh, dear colleagues, that uh, next semester, yeah, so summer semester, we'll make uh, a kind of a yeah, small pause with our colloquium. In other words, uh, my very good colleague from the University of Viadrina, Werner Benecke, uh, he will uh, somehow took uh, this colloquium idea and continue it is Osteuropa colloquium, mostly in German. Uh, but our big hope, I mean, not just me, but like our entire team I've already introduced, is to return, to come back with this format, online format, Ukrainian studies focus uh, in the autumn. Okay, so let's put it this way. Maybe uh, this upcoming summer is too hard for Ukrainian topics, so we should wait until the autumn to come and then continue <laughs> somehow. Uh, but uh, I would really uh, invite and ask all of you to stay in touch, to stay in touch with our chair. And uh, maybe let me even write it down. So we have our uh, email address, which is very simple. It's Ukraine. Uh, or Europa Uni DE, so you could always use it uh, and especially to get our newsletter. Yeah, so the next one is coming uh, because we have some new book projects. We have also some new videos for our YouTube channel. We still hope very much to have our next uh, Trans Regional Academy in the autumn in Sofia in Bulgaria. And of course, we'll come back with our colloquium, as I've just said. So in other words, we really hope uh, that we stay in touch, that we communicate and we'll discuss our you know, projects, ideas, articles, uh, whatever. And then we'll meet uh, again uh, in the autumn, having a new colloquium program and uh, a new perspective uh, on it. Uh, so, uh, Thank you very, very much again for your time and attention, uh, for your participation in the discussion. It was a great experience uh, for us, a great experiment for us. And now, now I'm sure that it was a good one and uh, I'm sure that we'll continue doing it. As I said, let's stay in touch. Let's enjoy spring and upcoming summer. And I very much hope to see all of you again in the autumn to come and we'll continue discussing uh, Ukrainian topics in international, interdisciplinary context. Thank you very, very much. And have a good night or evening left. Yeah, let's enjoy it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Do <laughs>